Hello everyone and welcome to the show. Today's guest should be a familiar face to anyone who's watched archaeological media online. Mark Barkman Astles is the creator and face of Archeo Soup, a YouTube channel he established way back in the almost prehistoric vlogger days of 2010. In his 12-year career as a professional archaeologist, he's had seven years as a trading business, produced more than 1,500 videos, and amounted an impressive 3.5 million views online. But what are some of the challenges and realities tackled by the public faces of archaeology today, particularly in an environment that's increasingly politically divisive and inundated with rhetoric and pseudo-archaeology? Mark shares some experiences from his impressive career so far, and it's fair to say that it's not all fun and lollipops. So settle in as we dig into the life and career of Mr. Soup himself, Mark Barkman Astles. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my genuine pleasure. Good afternoon. How are you today, Paul? Uh, very well, thank you. All the better for having you on the show, I must say. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I, <laughs> um, I'm obviously familiar with Mark from his work on Archeosuit Productions and the work on the YouTube channel. And I do want to get into that because you've been running that for a very long time. Um, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Commendable amount of time. But first, I'd really <laughs> like to get into what first inspired you and your interest in archaeology. Oh, uh, I think I, I think I, I think I've embellished, or rather, I have solidified. Embellished is the wrong word. I've solidified a bit of a, a mythical origin story for myself in some respects. In, in so much as my earliest actual memory of being enthusiastic about archaeology and history was probably when I was a toddler, and uh, we were we were visiting uh, a place called Beeston Castle in Cheshire, and um, at that point. Uh, my uh my dad was still alive and uh he and my mum were trying to look after my brother and uh, and while they were sort of tending to him you know nappy problems i think i started to 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 explain to a bunch of tourists who were visiting the castle what they were looking at i could i could see you know that these these adults towering above me were deeply confused about what this thing was and i said that is a guard robe and i went <laughs> <laughs> and i proceeded to walk them through uh the different features of of beeston castle going from place to place and they literally followed me around like a little tour guide for about i think about maybe 15 minutes you and got an uh, early taste of archaeological fame i did and also and it's oddly enough i i i, I really it wasn't. It's not so much that that I enjoyed having the, having an audience and having people listen, you know, pay attention to me, but I really enjoyed being able to share something that I found genuinely interesting with with with, with these people, and, and that, so so I, I do remember uh, that that basically my parents kind of stood off from the group watching as this sort of happened. They were at the back of the group, and when it was finished, we went and got a you know got a lollipop. So it was. <laughs> That was probably the that's probably the earliest you know, earliest um, indication of what I'd ended up doing. But but really, if you'd asked me uh, before I went to university, immediately before I went to university to study archaeology, I probably would have said to you that I was destined to be an archae uh, an artist or an architect. Actually, so uh, not an archaeologist. I sort of fell into it kind of at the last minute. Actually, so how did that process go? Were you planning to go and study architecture or art or? What was the situation? Well, uh, I uh, I was I I'd, I'd done rather well uh, in my exams, and I was one of those despicable people who who's quite good at everything, and that means, unfortunately, that it's really hard to make a choice about what you want to do with your life, and um, and <laughs> it's oh poor you, poor you, you know, <laughs> good at everything you turn your hand to, but but it meant that that it also meant not only did but, could I do anything that I wanted to? It also meant there was lots of pressure from lots of people saying, do this, do this, do this. So my grandparents, for example, were very keen that I try and go and be a doctor. Uh, my mum had a strong sense that uh, that art was my my destiny. And she thought, well, maybe a middle ground would be architecture. And all these influences were sort of pushing me in those directions. But um, but really, it was it was following a level art in particular when you put, you put so much effort and work into a piece uh, a sculpture or a painting or a drawing or a, a portfolio and then someone sums that up by giving you a letter you get b c 
A. Mm. Uh, although I think I've ever got ever got a C, I probably would have committed suicide. And <laughs> I was so wound up at that point in my life, very tense, um, very nervous young man, that it just occurred to me that I didn't want to be doing this in college, for example. I, I went to, to an open day at a local uh, college, a place called Yale College in North Wales. And... I, I couldn't face it. I couldn't face the prospect of creating for um, for, uh, for for someone to mark, really. So, so I f- kind of fell back on my interest in history, uh, and uh, at that point, I suppose I would have described it as history. When my then girlfriend was going off to do a uh, an excavation, a taster excavation in Cheshire, at a place called Poulton Abbey, which is quite a well known. Uh, or was quite a well-known little um, monastic site. Uh, Time Team have filmed there, uh, I think, in the years since I was there. And it was on that week away, uh, and, and I, I, in all honesty, it wasn't. I wasn't there to impress anyone. I wasn't there to impress my girlfriend or anything like that. I was literally wondering, I was curious about what this would be like. And it was on that week away that I realised I did, despite all of my... Uh, you know, my young man, emotional, turmoil, angst, you know, troubles in life. Uh, I, I could do this. I could, I could apply a bit of creativity to the process of archaeology. I could really get into the process of, of gathering data. And in particular, actually, that was when I excavated my first skeleton. I've actually got a photo, well, three photos, because I wasn't very good at taking archaeological photos at that point, um, stitched together on my wall of my first skeleton, actually, in the office. And, um, and yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of how it, how it happened. And I'm really happy to say that I never, never looked back, I never, never regretted going on to do archaeology. You seem to have quite a wide area of uh, interest in archaeology generally. Are there any particular subjects or periods or civilizations that pick your interest or did you go in for the general archaeology and just kind of pick and choose as you went i'm definitely a generalist i'm, I'm not i wouldn't i wouldn't, don't think I, you could tie me down to a particular point in time despite that being the first question that everyone asks you know uh, I'm not, i don't mean i'm not criticizing you i mean in general in life people ask archaeologists you can criticize me as much as you yeah. like it's cool i can always edit you out <laughs> People always ask archaeologists, you know, so what, which period are you interested in? What, uh, what essentially, what do you study? And they want, uh, that's basically because they're trying to start a conversation with you. Uh, but, but, but my interest has always been really, I think, in trying to see what archaeology can do. So tinkering with theory, um, but also trying to push the boundaries of, of, uh, of of how archaeological analysis can be applied to the material at hand, whether that's uh, uh, you know relatively recent stuff, say in a nineteenth century um, pristinely uh, sort of time capsuled house uh, somewhere in London, or or a, a prehistoric site on the Danube. I think I've always been interested in 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 that moment where where where, where archaeological theory tells you something that the material simply sitting there in front of you wouldn't tell you. It has to be, a, you know, this applied knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I suppose if you push, if you'd pushed me when I was doing my, uh, my degree, I would probably would have described myself as a prehistorian. And, and I think my, you know, my, my ongoing passion is prehistory. Um, but, uh, but, but, but since university, I, I've absolutely expanded into all sorts of different time period realms, partly because for example, I had to when I went to work at the York Archaeological Trust and uh, at the Orvik Viking Centre for a while, become at least familiar with the Saxons and Vikings in Britain. Uh, and since then, really, being open to all manner of different periods, and I suppose falling back on the some of the universal questions and the, and the ap- applicability of archaeological theory to anyone's specialism has tended to mean that I can normally have a... a half decent conversation with almost any archaeologist i don't find myself too uh too out of my depth because i've never i've never taken the time to get too deeply into one particular place or time mm. um if that makes any sense yeah absolutely it does yeah and it's it's interesting really that i think a lot of people outside the field do have this perception that 
archaeologists seem to know something about every ancient civilization or you know prehistoric mm-hmm. civilization that ever was and certainly when we see media depictions of archaeologists they tend to be these kind of all-knowing oracles almost all. exactly all-knowing oracles who yeah. provide mm-hmm. answers on every form of which is obviously very difficult to live up to because once you're working in something public facing you are then faced with that all of the time uh, yeah. that expectation that you will be able to answer on a, a question on and as an egyptologist obviously my my areas of knowledge are quite limited whereas you seem to personify that all rounder particularly in your video work very well so i mean i'm yet to wander into the occult though <laughs> <laughs> I, I wandered through that door very early in my career, but it's it is interesting. Like the 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 breadth of things that you cover: prehistory, Roman Britain, the Mayan, Saxons and Vikings, Tudor medicine, World War One. Even you know, we I was looking at a video you'd done on the Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, a huge range, but you've had a public facing strategy for a long time. Mm. Was that always the case? Was your early work in archaeology public facing or I mean, you said you were working for a Viking center. So presumably there was a lot of public facing work involved in that. Yeah, well, well, uh, immediately after graduating, I, 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 I kind of fell through a weird crack. I'm not sure if I would believe this if I heard someone else saying it, but it is the truth. Uh, I was it was the expectation was that my uh, dissertation in particular, which was likely to do very well and it did end up uh, getting um a double mark of 80 or thereabouts um that it, it would naturally lead on to a master's and so my interest in my dissertation was uh the, the title was fleshing out the no- knowledgeable agent uh towards a forum for the plausible discussion of agency and its implications in the past something like that you know, a good, a good acad- academic title always has a colon in there somewhere. Absolutely. So, so, yeah. So, yeah. So the the assumption was I'd be doing a master's, and people, everyone around me, really was talking as though within a couple of years I'd be basically a PhD and and lecturing probably at my university at Durham. But but it kind of fell through. The reason being that the university presumed that I was a shoe in for AHRC funding, and the AHRC presumed I was a shoe in for some sort of other scholarship or something like that. In other words, I think I peaked quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and actually, looking back at my dissertation, I, I did something which was, it was a bit, it was it, it was very, it was quite ambitious. I had to go off and, and do a certain level of psych, you know, psychology learning and um, other, other realms, other specialisms, actually, within the department. I was attending first and second year classes just, just to get to a point where I could apply the things to what i was trying to construct and so when that didn't happen i was a bit confused and i went for briefly i went to work for a call center which was hell on earth <laughs> it was just a terrible situation because they the, what was interesting was that the call center sort of marketed itself uh, i won't name the call center but anyone who's in durham pro- a student probably knows where i'm talking <laughs> about marketed it itself as uh, as a place that 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 specifically recruited graduates because they had a way of talking and they, they, they had a, a, a sophistication to their approach to say marketing that was going to be an asset to the company. I thought, well, at the very least, I'm not going to be just stacking shelves here. And, uh, you know, this could be something I can do while I figure things out. But it wasn't, it really wasn't that it was, it was, we were just phone monkeys. And if you, if you had any uh, inkling of, um, for example, wanting you know, one thing that I'm quite that I've always been quite good at is is uh, unfortunately is systems analysis and trying to figure out how things can work better. And so, if you make suggestions to managers and senior managers, and well, if you did this this way, then this might, uh, it turns out they don't like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Funny thing, that. <laughs> and, yeah, and there were there were a couple of a couple of incidents like that where actually me and there was another, another chap who had done who had studied law and we were both getting very frustrated and and uh, I moved on uh, very deliberately. I, I sought out the opportunity to move to York. Now all of this, well, I promise you, is is coming around to answering your question. Um, I'm so the opportunity I'm to strapped move to in. I'm strapped okay, in. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, at the time, my brother was uh, at university, York St. John University. 
And so I moved in with him and um, some of his friends, which was an interesting experience. Um, you know, being sort of blasted back through the student experience, you know, back to the first, second year. Essentially, I had my student experience after university. I mm. studied like a like a um, uber nerd at uni, stressed to the to the nines. But afterwards, I I was suddenly living with students and basically doing the student thing. It was kind of like um, the young ones or something in mm. a TV show. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, that, that was the sort of situation that I was found myself in. And, and initially I was actually working at a petrol station. Now, all the way through this, again, pertaining to your question, I hadn't really developed, I don't think, a particularly confident outlook. I knew I, I, I developed uh, academically and I, and I had a, a confidence in what I knew I knew about but uh, I was still extraordinarily shy and nervous. And um, uh, this really came to a head when I, I got a job at a petrol station. While I was waiting, because all the, you know, I was looking for work in, I thought, there's got to be something in York that an archaeologist can do. And, but I got a job in a petrol station. And Finding I was, petrol. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I was terrible because I uh, really can't, I, it turns out I really can't read, um, or sorry, I could not read. I'm better at it now, but I could not read when Tom was just totally lying to me. So someone would come in or someone would be gesturing like, you know, hello, you know, can I fill up my car, please? And while someone else is buying a chocolate bar or something, I just ping them through. And it turns out they'd fill up a canister that they were hiding just behind the petrol pump and run away. And in the course of one afternoon, I think I lost a hundred pounds worth of, of petrol for that petrol station. It wasn't good. <laughs> that wasn't my first afternoon. That was my worst afternoon. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was that point that I realised that that this is not going to. This is. I had I had enough self awareness that this is not going to be um, obviously not going to be, be a career, but also I'm not going to. I'm never going to feel happy here, and I'm not going to to get that confidence by constantly being hoodwinked by people who want to get petrol mm. so um so i uh, i i started applying for um well there's i continued applying for roles uh, in tourism museums uh there was a couple there's well there still are a couple of very niche organizations in york um to do with uh architecture and archaeology but uh, but the the place where I, I got an, a job interview was at uh, the York Viking Center, the uh, um, Yorvik Viking Center rather, for the York Archaeological Trust, and and that was really good for me because you learn very quickly when you have visitors coming from all over the world to see Vikings, only to have you dressed as a Viking stood in front of them, not letting them into the museum because the toilet is blocked. <laughs> You learn very quickly to meet their expectations and to be entertaining and to uh, to think on your feet, mm -hmm. frankly. So, um, so it was a baptism of fire, and it was something that that I didn't know I needed because I presumed, you know, that that having done very well in my degree, that uh, that meant that I could I could talk with uh, with some element of authority on something. But actually, no, no, no. You, you need something extra. It's not just knowing what you knowing your subject it's also about being confident and charismatic enough to be able to communicate that in a way that the other person gives you more than three seconds of their attention mm. and and once you once you once you're in to their heads then you're fine but but if you just look as though you're unsure and unsteady then you're going to have a hell of a time especially at a place like Jorvik uh, so, so uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's how I ended up there, and and it, and it did very much form and formulate, I suppose, a sort of beginning of a theory of public facing archaeology and the need to have competent, confident, uh, cogent people working in, I suppose, what we broadly speaking call open archaeology today. Mm. And, and but that, but that though sort of combined with with an experience that, that I'd had in my second year at uh, uni, when in the summer, uh, between the second and third year, no, sorry, between the first and second year, in the summer we were meant to do uh, some excavation, get some experience, but I had been sick and I couldn't manage it, so I ended up in the in the Christmas New Year break of the second year, uh, working with the commercial unit at Durham. Um, university. It was called ACID, Archaeological Services, uh, University of Durham, and uh, and that was that. That had been interesting because 
I, again, it highlighted that I could do the job and I could I could apply the knowledge and 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 the people I was working with, even though they they were gruff archaeologists who gave gave as good as they got, and they expected me to do the same. Although at that point I was not remotely ready for the banter. I also observed that these archaeologists, even though they were they were confident, a little bit grizzled, they were also it was not their priority to talk to the public about what they were doing. So in this particular excavation, we were we were digging at a um, the site of a World War II bomb that had exploded what had been a churchyard, mm. and in the 1940s, uh, bits of grave furniture, you know, uh, gravestones and coffins and bodies had been spread over a wide area and then quickly reburied in order to rebuild the road that had been bombed. And we were there to establish how far this debris had gone ahead of the building of a, a supermarket, which is, which is, uh, of course it's still there to this day, but it's there now. It's called, um, Asda. Huh. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, while we were doing that, we had lots of people coming over and saying, you know, e, what are you doing? You know, kind of thing. Is that, is that, you know, what, have you found any treasure? And because of that, the archaeologist I was working with, um, just rolled their eyes and said, Oh, you deal with it. So, so, uh, you know, I'd go over and I'd just start talking to the, to these um, usually little old ladies about what we were doing. And it became clear that not only were they interested in, they were, they were asking those stereotypical, you know, stereotypical questions about treasure, but also they wanted to know specifically, have you found any, any human remains? Because they knew the story of what had happened then. They knew that there was this, a bomb had fallen. They knew that the, that the, the, the graveyard had been uh, quickly reconstituted. And uh, they wanted to know because basically they, genuinely felt that they were connected to these 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 bodies they probably were mm. and so just by taking a moment to to see that a little seed was planted and by having that conversation they went away and actually not only did they go away and stop uh, inverted commas bothering the archaeologists but also they went away and came back with sausage rolls so, <laughs> so, <laughs> which the archaeologists very much enjoyed so that seed of an idea of 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 having uh not presuming what the public wants to say, not not rolling your eyes when you do get a stereotypical question, because the follow up is almost certainly going to be something a bit a bit surprising, combined with the sort of Jorvik baptism of fire mm -hmm. to create a, I suppose, what would become archaeosoup. This idea of of ethically and purposefully structured public archaeological dialogue for the purpose of educating the public but also actually to a certain extent initially at least making archaeologists lives easier as well if that makes any sense it does it does and there's actually this kind of ties into something i read on your website which is um it was a it was a subsection of some of the work that you're doing some of the outreach that you do mm -hmm. and it says mm -hmm. intrigue and integrity and i think mm. that's, that's a really interesting um way to frame that in a way but coming back to the process how did soup start and and i guess why soup oh God. <laughs> well uh, okay uh you get that soup. a lot don't you <laughs> i do get it a lot but it, it's fine i mean it's uh, you know why soup soup archaeo, archaeo soup is not the name i'll start at the end the, the, the name i think has come to be very useful because it sort of encompasses the fact that a bit of everything goes into the pot I, I do a range of different activities in lots of different ways. I, I'm open to working with almost anyone. And and so I think soup works well. But I'm sorry to say that the origin of the name is quite dull. It, it comes from uh, when I was a student and uh, I was, um, again, you know, quite a shy, shy young man. So I'd spent a lot of time on the Internet and I got in with a, a group of people who, um, who were a bit weird, a bit odd surprisingly <laughs> and uh, what what uh, it was a all surrounding a website called um what was it a nice cup of tea and a sit down dot com or something like that and some associated oddities there were there would be there would be competitions run by the by these groups and one of the one of the competitions one one day was to put soup uh soup tins into random photographs <laughs> and and the winner would be the person who could get the soup tin into the most interesting photo so you know uh a picture of Churchill holding soup or something like that, and uh, he wanted the the uh, the competition entries to be to be uploaded to Flickr, 
and tag to to you know to tag his account so that he could see them and so i had to choose a username for Flickr, and because it was a soup based competition it was archeo soup and i was an archaeology student but flash forward a few years um three or four years in 2010 when i was um this was this is having left uh, the York Archaeological Trust to come and uh, marry my amazing wife here in the Northeast. I was looking for a job. There was no jobs to be had. And uh, to keep myself sane, I thought I'd start a YouTube channel. And um, uh, Archaeo Soup just sort of floated into my head. And it, it's a, it's, an, it's, a, it's I can't really explain why, but from day one, it occurred to me I wanted to have some element of, of consistent branding. Mm -hmm. And um, by that, I don't mean that in a corporate sort of, you know, what's your brand kind of thing, but more a case of I wanted to feel as though what I would, what, no matter what I said and how I said it, people could connect the dots and connect these things together through having this thing from the beginning. So I, um, I designed the, uh, the Archeo Soup logo over the course of one night on Microsoft Paint. <laughs> and um, it, uh, it actually, uh, uh, initially, I was going to be some, because I was thinking of applying my experience at the Viking Center uh, initially and it's going to be something about uh, like a viking kind of wooden carving logo but i thought no 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 no. i, I, I thought it was going to be much more fun to have this little green globular soup with some bones sticking out and a spoon something a bit a bit cartoon uh cartoony and and, and hopefully in that sense approachable mm -hmm. and um and hence archaeo soup and so it is it, it's it's a, it's a weird it's a strange thing to explain as much as i didn't i didn't um, start off with this logo and branding idea from the perspective of it was going to be a business idea or something. It wasn't even, for example, for copyright reasons. It was mm. just, I think, for my own sense of consistency, in so much as if I was if I was doing this to stay sane while looking for work, uh, I needed it to have, I needed it at least to have some sense of purpose and, and routine and structure. Yeah. And so, hence, from you know, from day one, uh, Archeo Soup and, and a very particular logo. It's a really commendable effort as well and i mean that in the sense of effort not in the kind of oh you made a good effort kind of patronizing way i mean seriously it's it's <laughs> eight years of continuous uploads regular uploads um mm. a very broad range of subjects and a really kind of impressive history when you start falling down the rabbit hole of all the work that you've done and mm. you seem to cover a number of bases as well so you you're on the one hand you're providing video content and you're creating content for you know, online consumption. On the other hand, you're also doing video production and you're doing um, guest lectures and you're doing workshops in mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So could you talk about, you know, some of the variety of your work and, and the stuff that you've been trying to put forward over the last few years? Yeah, well, so none of it was really planned. Uh, really, the, the range of activities that I've been doing over the past uh, eight or nine years, depending on how you count it, or seven years, actually, depending on how you count it, came out of opportunities presenting themselves. And initially, the uh, the, the the plan, and quite literally, I, I sort of came up with a had to come up with a business plan, was to continue with the YouTube channel and uh, have that as a sort of like a passive presence. And also, that was the that was this coming back to the sense of being of, of being an, an, an ethic behind how I was working was that I wanted, no matter what I was doing or how I was doing it, to always have new things for people to learn that they didn't have to pay for. Mm -hmm. So the YouTube channel was always that. Um, two years into the YouTube channel, this is when I was starting to think this could be a, this could be a business, around about 2011, 2012, um, I, uh, I started to think, okay, well, I'll start offering local school workshops. So that's uh, that started with what I knew best from an educational standpoint, Vikings. And then over the years, I added to that, depending on what teachers wanted or what the curriculum changed to offer. And actually, in that sense, I'm so pleased now, even though Michael Gove was uh, was an interesting experience for teachers, certainly as a sec uh, education secretary, mm -hmm. he was he made a very bold step in introducing prehistory to the national curriculum. And if you want, we can talk about that in a bit. But uh, the, the, the uh, so, yeah, workshops. And then uh, 2013, Durham Library, the University Library, was proudly exhibiting the Lindisfarne Gospels. Uh, and at that time, 
because of my connections with staff at the university, they were looking to, for us to commission someone to do some films promoting that exhibition. And so I cheekily said, I can do that before I knew I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also that I could do that before I had the equipment really to do it. So what I actually wangled was that they paid me ahead of time. Amazingly, I used that money to buy the equipment and then I made it happen. But also, actually, I shouldn't I shouldn't skip over or ignore the fact that in that sort of couple of years from the beginning of the YouTube channel to to um, to starting formally trading in 2012, uh, I was very much supported by a growing uh, YouTube subscriber base. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, they, they they funded through crowdfunding my my first computer, so a laptop. Oh, actually, which I still have, I think, actually. My first camera, which was a little Panasonic HD thing, and also my first piece of editing software. Uh, so so at every stage, I've been fortunate enough not to have to you know, go into debt to grow um, what I'm doing or to expand what I'm doing. And then really ever since then, my, my, my interest has been in the pursuit of, and more, ever more formally, the pursuit of doing and examining this thing of public archaeology uh, from as many different angles as possible, and some of that means developing certain talks and workshops for 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 my colleagues and students to to uh, to hopefully learn something from, or at least um at least uh, learn what not to do. Part of it has been expanding into, for example, public uh, you know sort of turning up at summer fairs at local local events around certainly in the north of England, and just being a, a, a summer fun activity that people can come along and ask what's archaeology something i suppose that that's more than just turning up as a roman and that's one thing that i learned or no that, well, that i learned but also that i decided very early was that i didn't want to be someone going into schools dressed as mm -hmm. say a viking and pretending to be a viking so even initially early on i would actually go in in costume because it was quite useful to demonstrate period costume in a workshop but I would never present myself as as a period person. I'd always be an archaeologist. And this was for a couple of reasons. This was actually something that I learned at Jorvik, actually. And everyone at Jorvik adopted their own tactic for, for talking to, to, especially to school groups. But my tactic was to to not go along with this pretense of being from the past because immediately it becomes a game to try and catch you out. Mm. You're not really from the past. How do you, you know? Why aren't you freaked out by the ceiling lights? You know that kind of thing. <laughs> What's this? What's this? They're you know, holding up their mobile phone, and you go, "Oh, it's a mobile phone, obviously." So, uh, if you dispense with that pretense, then actually you can you can you can be answering questions from a modern archaeological perspective, and actually be much more useful from an education education standpoint. You can also actually have fun with it as well. I mean, for example, um, it's really useful to acknowledge that you're that you're living now and that you <laughs> that you are a, an archaeologist when say uh eight nine year old says um what words can't you teach us in old english <laughs> 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 you know and you decide on a limit and i did decide on my limit fairly early fjordtan was as bad as i was going to go farting um and uh and you know you can have fun with that but then so you know that, that was that's part of the work that i do but I, th I think something that I'm finding really that, well, that, I, th that I think is probably going to be the, the the next thing that I do, but also this, that I'm finding really, really motivational at the moment is talking about and reassessing the purpose of history now. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean helping archaeologists, especially students, to to think about first of all being confident and and and. Uh, and clear in in talking about their work publicly because that's going to help them with funding it's going to help them with their own confidence and uh, and in also really ever since ever since the days of time team people expect archaeologists to be able to talk and to well to be able to but also to want to talk about their work publicly yeah but also beyond working with with my peers and colleagues and with students i at this i think at this point onwards, certainly in the context of what's happening in a couple of months at the time of recording, mm -hmm. um, the big B word on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very interested in in what what history has done for us in the past seventy years or so, and what we now need from history moving forwards. Because really, history is always something that we we create in the moment. And of course, you know this. Of course, lots of people listening to this will know that that history is simply 
the the best story we can tell ourselves based on the given evidence at any given time. Mm. We are perceiving the, pa- the the past from the standpoint of the present, and more often than not, history it seems to me acts as either a um, a justification or an explanation as to how and why people are here doing what they're doing today in a given society in particular. For the ancient Greeks, there was this sense of a golden age that they could never quite live up to, but they would try their best. And uh, and that, that drove them to strive in art, in literature, in war, heroism, and all this sort of thing. For the... Uh, you know, for, well, actually, for, for Caesar, just moving a little bit further forward in time, Caesar himself was was driven by this sense of of living up to Alexander. Yeah. You know, and yet for lots of people throughout European history, living up to Caesar was the big thing. So mm. we all we all, we have history on our back. It's the monkey on our back, and what just what history tells us is very important. And I think history recently in in Britain has been more or less a founding myth of. I don't, you know, I don't want to go too far down this road, but I don't want to interrupt you. I think you're you're, no, no. <laughs> you're going down a, a really interesting path here. It's a, a it's a founding myth of of blitz spirit. Mm-hmm. It's a founding myth of um, a time when, when Britain uh, Britain survived, and that's become something else. It's become a time when we stood alone. I'm hearing about that a lot mm. these days. It's become a time when. Um, uh, when we, de- well, I, I think a couple of days ago, uh, a prominent politician says that, or said that Britain mortgaged her future, gambling on the destiny of Europe, and that Europe now owes us something, and and it it seems to me that 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 this that this founding myth, this frankly this obsession with the Second World War, has defined the function of history for our society for the past 70 years. And now that, that that's going out of living memory, it's going to become a mythology even more. Mm-hmm. And I wonder whether or not at this point we have an opportunity. If we are having the big, the big B word occur and there's going to be this, you know, this break with, with our current status in the world, then maybe we need to, we need to develop a, a history that serves us better to identify our true place in the world and how we can be better global citizens, how we can relate to uh, ourselves and each other within this country, never mind externally, in a more productive way, and how we can essentially stop characterizing, I suppose, stop characterizing uh, especially our European neighbors as somehow adversarial. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Now that that's not that's not that's not going to be an easy project. <laughs> like, well, I, mean, yeah. I, I was going to say you've only taken on the uh, one of the defining problems of our age. Well, it, it, well, and and that's the thing is that I I I am not I you know I'm not remotely deluded enough to think that that, that this is something that I, that I that one person can do. Never mind myself. Um, but it's something that I, it's a conversation that I want I want to try and start to encourage people to have mm. because I think that we can't keep doing this to ourselves. Um, and I, I, I'm really trying not to be political. I'm talking very specifically about the function of history for how we think about our own nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that's probably what where my interests l- will be lying in the near future. In this relate- It's sort of morphed from an interest in that moment where archaeology meets the public gaze to being something more about now the, the zeitgeist and the function of history in how we uh how we chart a course into the future because really if you think about it history also has always only ever served to give people a sense of of where they're going or where they want to go next you know the story of your of your village the story of your country the story of your family gives you something to live up to but also gives you something to plan from you know i want to outdo that person or i want to live up to that person or i want to not be my father or whatever you know however people define it yeah that's a really interesting perspective and it as um it ties into a lot of the ways in which heritage discussions of heritage are innately connected to discussions of identity in modern times yeah. mm. and this does actually tie in quite well with with where i wanted to uh, steer you next actually and, and things i wanted to ask you about at least and that's <laughs> not scripted honestly it's, no, no, it's, no no it yeah, really isn't no, but i do i do have some yeah. areas i want to go near in particular and and one of them was to ask and you've kind of almost answered this really in a non-explicit way is that is it 
the job of the historian and archaeologist to debunk bad history and science? I think, first of all, it's the job of, of the archaeologist and historian to, first of all, understand that unlike, I don't know, unlike a chemical theory, you know, a chemical um, equation or something like that, we don't own the work that we're producing. At least I don't think we should own it. We are uh, given, I suppose, through some sort of tacit contract, the privilege of being able to delve into some of the material that, that's been left in the ground from previous generations. Mm. And I think, first of all, it's our job to to serve that and to acknowledge that that um, uh, that we don't own it. And part of that acknowledging that we don't own it not only involves kind of the fact that we're borrowing it almost from the people whose stuff it was, for example, a Roman coin, um, but also that we are co-observing these objects in any given moment, along with a heck of a lot of people who are just as interested as we are. Mm-hmm. History, as you say, is tied in with identity. It's tied in also with things with concepts such as nationalism and this sort of stuff, and that means it's highly emotive. And people, people want to know about this stuff. And I think this is this is just briefly takes me all the way back to to my observations of archaeologists, especially commercial archaeologists on site and their interactions with the public. I think that stuff has got a lot better, but I think it used to be the case that archaeologists. Had a had a bit of an issue with having or having to talk to the public. Or, you know, it's much better these days, and there's much more of an expectation that that will happen. Uh, but 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 we've always owed it that owed it to the public to talk to be to talk about this stuff and to be open and honest about it. But uh, in but in the same way that 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 there is a soft and intangible truth and truism to to acknowledging sort of the uh, the, the the herd memory about something so for example uh, you know what um what the medieval world is or was or uh, there's always there's also some another another sort of solemn duty that we have and that is to try and add to and elevate the status of that herd knowledge and that herd memory and i use herd in the nicest way possible i'm, 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 not, I'm not saying herd as in you know sheep mm-hmm. i mean group group you know the cultural zeitgeist uh, is that yeah, cultural zeitgeist, the, the the general understanding of where our our actual knowledge is about certain periods in the past. It's up to us to to raise that and not just not just engage engage with people's assumptions about the past. Because the other, I mean, well, the, the other day I was uh, I was I was talking about something very similar with, with a, a colleague, and and um, I sort of came up with the with the analogy that if you you know I love Bakewell pudding. I love it. Bakewell pudding is my favourite dish. Uh, I've only ever been to Bakewell twice, and both times I got a lovely pudding. But if I uh, if I was given the option, and I didn't know anything else, I would just continually continually ask for Bakewell pudding. And so, when it comes to, uh, for example, the BBC or someone else commissioning a documentary, the person who produces that commissions Bakewell pudding. Whereas actually the archaeologist, or I suppose in this case the patisserie owner, mm-hmm. um, knows that, yeah, Bakewell pudding's great, but actually Bakewell pudding along with some custard, that's brilliant. And then if you add in as a second course, we've got these beautiful little uh, chocolate eclairs and there's other stuff that we could, you know, there's all these exotic ingredients that we've recently found. And actually people's taste for Bakewell pudding can be augmented and, and added to and and people soon they're asking for the whole afternoon tea. They're not just wanting the old favourite. Mm-hmm. And to bring that back to archaeology, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's the Romans, for example. You know, when people uh, commission, say, public um, public programs or uh, exhibitions about the Romans, I think it's our responsibility, yes, to engage with what the public expects, to give them the army, to give them latin to give them this idea of bathing and laws but also to challenge that and say look these guys were not us the father of the family pater familias could have his daughter killed and not have to explain it to anyone that's not us the uh, in the roman world uh, people were traveling from as far away as china and settling and dying in what is now london um that is us surprisingly but that's probably not what you thought the romans were and 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 as hard as that moment can be, I think if we're all doing it and we're all raising that general sense of, of what the past is, 
we'll all be able to get to a point where actually archaeologists don't roll their eyes when someone gets something egregiously wrong about the past. But also the public holds what they are seeing and hearing about archaeology to a higher standard, to a higher account. They won't accept you know, a, 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 these old presumptions about the past because actually they'll understand that, that crucially archaeology is all about finding what's new about the past. It's not about it's not about meeting someone's expectations. It's not about confirming even that the past occurred, because that's actually a pointless activity. I'm not remotely interested in confirming that yesterday happened, but finding out that yesterday, next door, yeah, you know, my neighbour invented a a new a new uh, a new sandwich. Back to food again. That's exciting. A lot of your analogies <laughs> you know? are making me hungry. And whilst we're here, I just want to I just want to jump in on a point actually because you. You mentioned, you know, the archaeologists of, of yesteryear, perhaps there being less of a trend for engagement, shall we say, to put it kindly. Do you think mm -hmm. that's fed into this notion that I've certainly encountered a lot in Egyptology, which is that there is there is a conception on the parts of people outside academia or archaeology that there is some kind of conspiracy to cover up the quote unquote truth of the past and the fact that we're all somehow in some kind of cahoots where we know that X, Y, and Z really was built by aliens, really was built by ancient peoples from a certain place or locale or ethnicity, and we're just covering it up to keep a party line. Do you think, do you think like archaeologists themselves have helped perpetuate this by inaction? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 yes, exactly. I mean, and, and funnily enough, I mentioned to you before we started recording that last night I, I really enjoyed a lecture that I gave um, at Newcastle University. And part of that lecture touches on upon exactly this mm. in so much as that's one of the reasons why archaeologists need to care about, even if they're not going to engage with uh, public archaeology, they need to acknowledge and care about it and its value. Because, again, this all goes back to public expectation so the public come over because they're curious and especially since for example time team they 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 think archaeologists archaeologists want to talk to them mm. um if archaeologists don't talk to them someone else will and uh someone else will do it in an accessible glossy coffee table book that can sell a million copies and that will be halfway around the world before your niche journal article has been read or cited twice yeah and um that in that sense i, I you know f f to my colleagues i would be absolutely brutal in saying yes there's no there's, there's just no room for debate on that and uh, and archaeologists but you know the thing, the thing is though, i think archaeologists are much better at now talking about this stuff but but we but we're now on the back you know we, we're start not on the back foot but we're starting we uh we we've given the advantage mm. the head start to to other other uh, formats um mr graham hancock for example is an astonishing example of the ability to weave nonsense and to weave nonsense in a in a way that, that that's just about convincingly archaeological enough i mean the, the, the analogy i used last night in my lecture was this like a house of cards um and now that's it may sound twee but specifically uh it is an argument constructed along these sorts of lines <clears throat> here is a skull now this skull appears to be vaguely human i think we can agree on that but if uh, if if this is true then uh, this person when they were alive they must have must have had a pet that's probably not not too much of a stretch so if if they had a pet that pet clearly clearly would have been devoted to this this human being here I don't think you agree with me on that. If that's true, uh, well, clearly, then the pets had to have some way of communicating effectively with the human being. And, of course, if you agree with me on that, which there's nothing to disagree with there, then they must have had language. Now, the pets, if they have <laughs> language, that language must have eventually approached some sort of complexity comparable to the mathematics of Einstein. Now, of course... <laughs> If that's true, then pets are, in fact, our gateway to the next stage of evolution. Um, very quickly, you find yourself in the in the weeds and you start quite innocently. And, and actually, my first interaction with um, with pseudo archaeology, we should name it mm -hmm. pseudo archaeology. I was going to ask you, but yeah, I'm glad yeah, you've yeah. got that. Yep. <laughs> 
was with a book, uh, a book called um, Unsolved Mysteries from Reader's Digest. And it was a really exciting book and I loved it. And I, I, I still have, have the copy upstairs. It was my dad's book, in fact. And uh, he was, I think he was, he was just as interested in this potential for for stuff out there and the idea that you might be the person to solve that mystery. And, and if nothing else, the fact that you're being welcomed into this, this, this hidden knowledge in that sense, it's very similar to what, you know, what, what we observe in the ancient world, these mystery cults where once you're a member, you're, you know, the secret and, Mm -hmm. and it, it's power. It gives you a sense of power. It gives you a sense of wonder. It's, it's, it's a, you know, it's it's as old as the hills. Um, but crucially, pseudo archaeology does not function to um, it does not function to answer any questions. It thrives on always having the question not answered, and it absolutely thrives on always being able to portray itself as somehow alternative mm-hmm. or persecuted by the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And and I think that is only possible when archaeologists hide their work in some way or are seen to hide their work in some way one of the worst examples of this recently that i saw was actually perpetrated unfortunately by two archaeologists um themselves in so much as there was an article it was about a a, a graveyard in north somerset a place called yarton where 300 graves have been uncovered and there were sort of late late saxon early no late roman early saxon uh, burials and um uh, it's in the article, so I can I can name him. It's you know, a matter of public record. Um, Mark Horton of Bristol University comes in, presenter on Coast, I think, uh, from time to time, um, comes in and says, "Yeah, this is very strange, very strange indeed. Why aren't they talking about this 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 site? This site could be of potential national significance." Uh, then Cat, uh, I forgot what her surname is, but Cat, the archaeologist on site, she says, "Well, actually, no. It's it's best practice not to talk about this stuff because." And she basically infers that it's to do with grave robbers and, you know, uh, this responsible handling of human remains. And while these two are figuratively bickering in this news article, it's left to uh, the developer to give the sober statement on the condition of the site. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, well, there's nothing really there. And the, the the burials will all soon be gone. So don't worry. The houses will be built soon. And so you have this weird situation where not only are archaeologists sometimes bad at looking uh open about their work sometimes they look as though they don't even know what best practice is when it comes to talking publicly about their work and sometimes that leads to the very person who has a vested interest in destroying archaeology being left looking like the sober grown-up in the room who who's actually giving the public uh, a statement on the condition of the archaeology now that 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 that's in the realm of 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 best practice and 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 development and building and this kind of thing but but all of those conversations these little molehills that archaeologists seem to fight over mean that while we're doing that and i do count myself in you know i'm part of that community and i'm not saying i i try not to do that myself i don't think i do but i'm part of that community but while we're doing that uh yeah of course someone's going to be able to come over and talk about atlantis and get attention Mm -hmm. because archaeologists all too often seem to be a little bit inaccessible now i think we're getting much much better much much better and there's lots of really great archaeologists who are very open public facing um in their practice practice but there's also an irony in so much as lots of the discussion we have about for example public archaeology is done behind a paywall on a journal mm. so we're still not there you know and, and even 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 those people who are talking about this this in, in as a practice i think are still not there there's still a tendency to to defend your uh your intellectual property or to defend your um your specialism because it's also a competitive world as well that, that we're working in uh, i'm not quite sure how you square that circle but i think again while we're wrestling with it you know your hancocks and your your um van Danikens are raking it in and it's and it's easy to do to keep you know, to perpetually not answer a question it's mm. easy to do you mentioned actually and I, I do find this whole area really fascinating and i always have and it, it's something actually i tried to tackle a little bit where i had space in my own work and the notion that there are there are forces academic forces and economic forces at work when you are working within that system which are inhibitive towards you 
getting your work out there and, and making it accessible, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've had that particular battle myself uh, at certain mm-hmm. stages and to the extent where sometimes one does wonder, should I really be chasing academic publishers or should I be just self-publishing and making things cheap and accessible? Mm-hmm. But of course, that's a completely different realm and that's a completely different it's a completely different type of writing and work and engagement. And, mm-hmm. and I think hence the need, exactly as you're saying, for more of this accessible kind of work, which is why I really love yeah. what you're doing. And you, you hit on some really important points there. I noticed you said on your website, you know, that pseudo archaeology can no longer be dismissed as the realm of the wacky or as being undeserving of the attention of quote unquote real archaeologists. Mm-hmm. And there's also the danger, of course, that and you note this as well, that it's quite easy to slip into that realm yourself. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Do, do mm-hmm. you do you have any salient examples of that off the top of your head or or is that just a general kind of warning towards engagement becoming problematic? I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have any any solid examples of our, of well-meaning archaeologists straying into the realm of pseudo archaeology, if that's what you mean. Um, but, but I think there are there is this this, this there's this weird tension on, on that is you know, very present uh, with archaeology, whereby we've been duped into thinking that we need to struggle to tell our story. And that we need to pay someone else mm. to publish our books, or that we we need to uh, sign away contracts for TV deals for uh, well-known uh, finds of national significance to American companies. Uh, it's um, it's 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 the it's the strangest thing. Archaeology, I think, is one of the most charismatic and interesting subjects. I think the public, more often than not whether it's post time team or not want to know what we're up to. I've never, I've never got into a taxi and had not had the taxi driver immediately when they find out that I'm an archeologist say, Oh yeah, yeah. I wish I'd been an archeologist. I was going to be an archeologist, you know, but you know, but my knee got in the way um, or something like that. But the point is, people want to know and we don't have, we shouldn't have to work this hard to, to get to, to, to get good information out there. I think the problem is, is that we ha- we ha- we hamstring ourselves by first of all fighting for the for the sunshine. Mm. Um, we presume that the offer made by a sticky-handed production company um, or, uh, or or you know um, journal publication network uh, is is uh, is the only one that's going to be on the table, and we. Also, I think, I mean, the problem is, is there's also another whole other culture here, which I know you're much more part of than I, I am, in so much as it's an undeniable truth that if you don't publish, you perish. And, you know, if, and if, if your work isn't getting citations in the academic world, this goes for archaeology, it goes for, the, as it were, you know, the more hard sciences or mm-hmm. positivistic sciences. Yeah. And also, it also goes for, you know, the humanities as well. You've got to be shown to be producing and that that's a that's a that that mechanism is self-perpetuating um, but it also from my perspective feels a little bit like a bit of a, a monopoly in that sense as well because actually it means that, that information is contained and it's contained for good reasons it's contained partly because in the old models uh the only way to get that that information out there and have it uh, replicated and, and spread as quickly as, and as far and wide as possible was to have a physical publication system, i.e. a journal. And the best way to do that was to pay for it to collectively and therefore everyone has to sort of pay your subs and so on and so forth. This also means that if it's in a contained bubble, a citation you know is coming from a rep- reputable source, uh, although that's been compromised, I think, in recent times with um, certain academics uh, like you know, Jordan Peterson's, for example, people say, oh, this person's been cited X many hundred times. But lots of those citations will be people saying this person's work is nonsense. But, but you know, that's that's a whole again, it's a whole that's a whole other world in terms of the reasons for that. But I, th- I think I'm not really sure. I, the, the problem is, it's not, it's not it, uh, you, you run the risk of sounding like like you want to be some sort of revolutionary. And I, I'm not tended towards that. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not the sort of person who burns things down. I'd much rather augment things. And um, and I think there just needs to be a slight shift towards accepting 
uh, that 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 while we're while we're increasingly distracted by matters of of ever increasingly small circles and exactitude the the broad strokes of the, the 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 cultural significance of the work that we do is so easily hijacked by someone who who ironically who has a youtube channel mm. now i'm not i'm not pointing at myself there a couple of years ago 2016 there was a youtube channel that was started i'm, I'm not plugging them um in so much <laughs> as they, they, they in in within the space of uh, two or three years they've managed to garner 878,000 subscribers as of yesterday and um, all they talk about is is conspiracy theories and nonsense. Where these that's where people are going, mm-hmm. and it's and people and I think it, it, it this is not a bad thing. Then, so it just demonstrates there is a hunger. It just needs we just need to be accessible, and we need to be more interested in in talking to people about the things that that, that we're excited about than we are in simply planning the next conference. Well, and there's or, there's definitely uh sorry to cut in, but there's definitely a a point to be made there as well about the stereotyping that has made this kind of idea of a heroic alternative truth seeker a lot yeah. more sexy and intriguing than mm-hmm. the kind of staid conservative picture of a stuffy academic archaeologist. Mm-hmm. These are really contentious things that we need to try and break down ourselves, I think, because no one's going to do those things for us. Well, I mean, would it also be controversial of me to suggest that these sorts of movements were stirring 10, 15 years ago? Oh, and, now, and now it's the language that's used in everyday politics, mm. if I'm honest. It is. This, this is exactly how people are encouraged to think about all manner of different establishments, not just archaeological establishments. Fake news. Yeah, fake news. Mm. But also the idea, and again, this, this very charismatic idea that there is a truth that's been hidden from you and that only i know and i can i can help you and we can find it together we can find those sunny uplands it's it's not it's not and the reason why i had this incidentally this to hand is because this was part of again part of my lecture last night but it's not a matter of of um for example jealousy professional jealousy it's more a case of frustration that there clearly are so many people out there who 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 are desperate for information about the past and uh, at the moment we're still essentially as a profession arguing over i suppose you know arguing over who owns that information mm-hmm. uh, and whether or not that information will be credited appropriately and none of us wants to lose out and and Again, I'm not sure exactly how we, we square that circle, but I suspect part of the answer is going to be finding a new model mm. for publication. Yeah, yeah, agreed. There's there's one more thing, actually, in this in this area, and I, I, I promise I, I'm asking because it is related. If you could, mm-hmm. or if you wouldn't mind, would you be so kind as to tell us the story of the poo in the post box? Because I believe that's quite relevant to what you're talking about here. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, poo in the post box. Well, well, yeah, poo in the post. I let's see, two thousand and fourteen, I think. Um, I was sent a question um, to answer in my questions of doom series. I'd uh, right from the beginning, I've always been open to answering questions from the public. And these questions, I should just say uh, that these questions are wonderful. They are a brilliant uh, and um, stimulating aspect of the work that i do because often they lead to new ideas and conversations with colleagues who uh who 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 never thought about something in the way that that say a five-year-old thinks about things and it was a question about pyramids in bosnia and um these pyramids had gained the attention of of uh uh, a very very excited very excited young man he he was saying oh these real because if these are real this is so exciting why aren't people why aren't more people talking about this and, and i i responded in video form as i tend to equally excited saying absolutely if these were real this would be incredibly exciting it really really would and i i, I would be on board with you but that sadly they're not pyramids they're what's called a flatiron a flatiron is a geological formation loosely pyramidal in shape basically pointy with three or four sides 
and uh, and and that's what these are and they're covered in trees because they're basically they're, they're pyramid shaped hills and uh, when i published that answer and i published it in all good faith i wasn't i wasn't tearing it down at anyone's ideas i didn't name anyone or anything like that. but I, I started to get some comments on that video that was from people in or well, some very particular people in bosnia saying that i didn't know what i was talking about i was being an english imperial imperialist even though i'm a welshman um <laughs> and um, <laughs> the ultimate insult <laughs> yeah exactly what did you call me and that uh that yeah there were some loose threats made on those videos as well and I, I didn't really take them seriously but eventually i ended up taking the video down because it was just becoming a distraction and at that point my youtube channel wasn't as it were quote unquote big enough for it just to disappear this was making a big m impact on 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 the 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 balance of comments and the tone of the youtube, YouTube channel so i did end up taking it down and that's what's one of the, my regrets is that i've never been bullied into into to recanting something as it were um but uh but i did i was essentially bullied into into taking something off off my youtube channel once but anyway i thought that was the end of it um and it wasn't I ended up getting in the post a few days later uh, an envelope in which there was a letter uh, that was covered in human excrement. As far as I could tell, it was human excrement. And the letter uh, was a, a very graphic threat of violence against me. And uh, it named my wife. It's one of the reasons why, I mean, very early on, people watching Archeo Soup started to call me Mr. Soup. I never encouraged it. And, you know, but, but people just said, Mr. Soup. So I sort of adopted that moniker, and um, uh, this is one of the reasons why I only ever refer to my lovely wife as my lovely wife, or as Mrs. Soup, mm -hmm. because uh, they named her, they named where she worked, they said that they, that they were going to follow her to her car and do horrible things to her. This obviously shook her up dramatically, uh, and, and it, took, it took a couple of years, actually, for her to really just relax after that. Um, I say in terms of relax about where she was parking at night. Mm -hmm. Um, but that happened once and it happened five years ago now. It happened, you know, quite a while ago. Uh, but I suppose this, this is one of the, one of the dark sides, I guess, of, of talking, talking openly and honestly about archaeology is that there are people out there who make money from, uh, from in this case, uh, perpetuating a, uh, a mythology surrounding these pyramids in Bosnia, a tourist industry. Apparently, apparently there were tea towels. That was something that was mentioned in the letter. They weren't able to sell their tea towels, <laughs> <laughs> or rather, I was threatening their tea towel selling uh, industry. And people are invested in in spreading, um, spreading these falsehoods, spreading essentially pseudo archaeology because it makes them money. Mm. Uh, in the case of of the YouTube channel I mentioned just before, I mean, at eight hundred and 50 odd thousand subs you're, you're making thousands of pounds a month from youtube and so as i say if we're not talking about it people will occupy that space and that space can be can be lucrative uh, especially if you're if you are once again if you're feeding the old favorites if you're giving them bakewell tarts mm. and if that if that bakewell tart happens to be a conspiracy about atlantis or how the parents were built by aliens or or how um how yes absolutely your irish identity is is reinforced as just one polemic thing uh there's always been an irishman on earth and you are descended from him um then then you know you 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 you're gonna you're gonna uh find a a very welcoming art market for, for for yourself but i think um i wouldn't say that that's common though i haven't been i'm not commonly frequently attacked by people um although you know i mean there are some topics more than others that, that get interesting comments oh absolutely definitely. absolutely and i mean that's that's an interesting story and thank you for sharing that with us because that's, that's it went to quite a dark place which you know having read the beginnings of that story um, and you only refer to the beginnings of that story on the website um, i had no idea just how dark that rabbit hole would get and I I'm think, sorry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I mean, like I say, I, I do appreciate you kind of um, um, sharing that because that's that's an interesting right. point and something that we need to consider as well is that, you know, when it comes to sharing the facts rather than the quote unquote truth, there are parties out there who are very vested in or invested in um, not having someone with any authority uh, doing so. And that is something that we do have to face 
on a sometimes daily basis and something that I'm guessing you have to face a lot more than others, given that you are public facing and having to deal with public comments quite often. Um, mm. And it's, I can imagine, I can imagine from my perspective, I, I would find that weakening. I would find that frustrating and, and you know, uh, it would probably make me very angry at times, certainly. Well, I, I mean, personally, I, don't, I, think, I don't think I've ever found myself well, no, I have found myself angry, obviously, when my wife was being threatened. Mm. Um, but but uh, I, because of my aforementioned cripplingly shy origins, uh, I'm like, um, it's like it's like my superhero origins uh, as as a really super shy version of Clark Kent. Um, <laughs> but because of that, I have a tendency actually to fall back in on myself. Uh, I tend to think that, uh, for example, you know, the cause is unwinnable. Uh, that actually, after nine years of of a YouTube channel, it should be doing much better and do, um and should have more of an impact than it does. But that very quickly goes away when I actually see the quality and the 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 frequency of the quality of the comments and the the community actually that's been fostered around talking like this this goes for for the for the public it goes for students but also actually frankly for colleagues i mean the other day uh, an archaeological uh, colleague i won't name him because i don't want to embarrass him um thanked me for for example for the the tone that i encourage for example on on archaeosoup social media where in his words not mine um what 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 happens is we we foster a, a human informed fun place to be and i'd much rather have that than have a place where i'm worrying about keeping up the the, the you know the conspiracy theory otherwise the checks stop coming in um uh, it, the, for example on our case for a little while well a couple of years ago now i decided i made the conscious decision to stop seeing it as a place where i simply share news articles but i also started to share the things that i'm interested in as a as a rounded archaeologist occasionally stuff from and i'm sure you'll you'll you're familiar with some of this stuff, comics and stuff. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> the the fact that 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 it can be fun being around a human being while doing this work, not just constantly being switched on, as it were. And I, th I think also as well, it must be exhausting being uh, a full time conspiracy theorist because you can never switch off. You can mm. never, you know, you know. Um, but also as well, actually, with that though comes moments when you. You you draw the line, you know. You you are Captain Picard on the Enterprise. This far, no further. The line must be drawn here, and and you will say about certain news stories. No, I'm sorry, this is nonsense. This person has to, you know, this is, and you 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 you're able to foster that because you're not permanently angry, you're not permanently talking down to people. Mm. You're, you're you're welcoming them into your into your into your world, and I think that's that's. I guess ultimately what what uh, what I've always wanted to do even before Archeo soup took off as a uh, started to glide just above the ground <laughs> um <laughs> as a as an enterprise um is I've always wanted to to be able to share with people why this stuff is interesting because uh, you know, on the flip side um it doesn't take long I think if you ask people the right questions to find something that they like that they're passionate about, that they that you can learn from them, and uh, and I think um, just encouraging that conversation is a is a good place to be. So it's it doesn't make me angry. It just make it just sometimes makes me think. I sometimes realise I come to the realisation, and this is unfortunately just the case, that no matter how hard I push at that door, there will be people on the day that I die who are convinced that aliens built the pyramids. <laughs> On the day that I die, who are convinced that uh, Roman Britain was basically a bit like Victorian Britain, and that you know the Romans were kind of like proto Englishmen. There'll be people on the day that I die who 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 are convinced that there is a um, a subculture, an underworld of of um, people who are trying to hide the true past from them. Mm. But that's not something that, if I dwell upon that for too long, I really kind of miss the point. I think, Mark. It has been a fascinating journey through the world of public archaeology and media archaeology today with you. Thank you so much for, for joining me and um, sharing your stories with us. And I, I would love to come back for a, a round two at some point, um, yeah, certainly to, to talk about the traffic lights of doom and various other fascinating things that you've done on your 
channel. Keep up the good work, man. I really enjoy your channel and uh, very glad that I became introduced to it and yourself. And hopefully we'll get to speak again soon mm -hmm. on some other archaeological facts and fun. Yeah, offer it. it's always a pleasure. And, and also, I mean, I feel as though, and I might be wrong, but I feel as though that I, I, I've run the risk here of sounding a bit monotone and kind of at times sort of militaristic in, in my approach to, 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 you know, having a, having a, a cause, you know, um, but, uh, but hopefully, uh, and if we do have more conversations, hopefully we'll be able to, to, I suppose, show, not tell mm -hmm. if so to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if people are interested, I'd definitely love to come back and we can just chat about more, more stuff. Yeah. Most definitely. And all you lovely people out there, all three of you, or however many are listening, <laughs> um, please do be sure to go and check out Mark's channel on Archeo Soup. There's, there's various different sub channels that deal with different questions, as we've discussed, that people send in, but also, you know, news items and things that have kind of popped up and become part of the public consciousness for a while. And Mark tends to bring an informed eye to all of those. So uh, do go and check out his work. Once again, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's sadly all we have time for today, but be sure to check back in for new episodes which continue to explore manifestations of the ancient world in the modern, including interviews with a bevy of archaeologists and Egyptologists, cometics and reconstructionists, and key players in historical entertainment, including authors, filmmakers, actors, and game designers. If you like the show, please subscribe and rate it on your preferred platform and tell all your friends. I've been Dr. Harrison. And this was the Profane Egyptologist podcast. Thanks for listening. Since this show is free and I want to make sure it stays that way, I will be introducing some ads over the course of the next few months. So please bear with me as I do that. Any show like this is a lot of work and of course it's unpaid. But if you like the show, you can support it by sharing, subscribing and reviewing on platforms like iTunes and generally helping spread the word. This episode is brought to you by Close Up Presenting. Close Up is a company of my own creation, which I started basically to scratch my own itch. Now, what makes Dr. Paul Harrison itch, I hear you cry? Well, when I first graduated from my PhD, there wasn't a lot of academic work on the ground. So I sidestepped into media, starting with presenting work. The problem for me was that even though I knew my subject area really well, I didn't have any formal training on camera. And I'd sometimes freeze and go blank or get nervous and fumble during important moments. In order to address this, I spent years and small fortunes taking presenter classes and even saw a voice specialist to help up my game and get confident on camera and microphone. Now, I eventually graduated to working as a producer for a private investment TV channel, and I noticed that a lot of the financial specialists there had the same problems I'd once had. And because they couldn't enjoy the process, they'd put it off, get more nervous, and feed a vicious cycle that I knew we had to break. These were extremely smart, competent people who knew their subject area. But once a camera was put on them, they might freeze or stutter or not know where to look or know what to do with their arms or bodies. And lo and behold, with a little bit of knowledge and all important practice, they actually started to enjoy the process. Now this helped smooth relationships between departments and meant they'd actually show up on schedule, even excited to record shows, all of which made it much better for everyone involved. After I left that company, I wrote down all the common pain points for people and wrote a course especially aimed at subject experts, be that from science, finance, history, or pretty much any background. I did this to help people who want to get on camera and appear as professional as they truly are in their areas of expertise, but without having to spend the years and fortunes I spent getting practiced at this. So if you need to be on camera for work, you do a lot of presentations, or perhaps you're a thought leader or aspiring science communicator, then this course is aimed at you. It's broken down into manageable topics with self-testing and assessment so you can track your progress. And it comes with a 30-day money-back full guarantee, so there's nothing to lose. I also have a special deal for listeners. If you input the code PROFANE, that's P-R-O-F-A-N-E in capitals, you'll get a special listener discount. And the link is in the bio or show notes. So check that out. Help keep the show going and help keep my cat in the manner of lifestyle she has become accustomed to with all the dreamies she can eat. Thank you, guys. Catch you next time.